All right. So continuing our uh, well survey of algorithms or of problems that are efficiently solvable and have an important role in computer vision. Today, I would like to talk about min cost flow and what it can do for you in the world of tracking. Um, so in tracking, there are, so first of all, what, what is tracking? Um, I have here uh, an example, which is very important for the industry and many applications. And uh, well, it's also a regime in which I've decided not to work on myself because I'm very critical of, of all things surveillance. Um, but that is an important scientific and industrial problem, how to track objects, people, things. Um, an application that's closer to my heart is this one here. So you see here um, dividing cells and uh, the task is to try and track each and every one of them and see where their offspring goes. Um, this is used in essays of for wound healing and you know all kinds of biological questions of course. Well, and it's, you know, isn't it much prettier than uh, people in some airport? Um, it also engenders um, a, a very different problem in terms of optimization. So um, if targets can or cannot divide, actually uh, makes a huge difference for how hard the optimization problem is. Now in tracking, uh, as I said, there are different, uh, I've called them here, um, schools of thought. And, uh, you know, none is perfect. Uh, each has its pluses and minuses. Uh, let's go through these. So the first school of thought just says, OK, I have space. I have time to better have a space time. And if I want to track things, that is essentially an instance segmentation problem. Well, it is maybe a little more than an instant segmentation problem. Because I've, if I treat it as a pure instance segmentation problem, so here I'm trying to, sh to show you one cell which then splits into two and one child goes on and the other child splits again. If this was pure instance segmentation, well, I would get one label for all of that. Um, but maybe I want different labels. Huh? Maybe I want to say that um, this is the parent cell and then this is daughter one, daughter two. And then daughter two again had offspring, like daughter 2.1, daughter 2.2, and so on. And so it's, it, I think it's a little bit more than instant segmentation, actually. But one view is to say, OK, I am trying to segment my targets in space time. Um, that is particularly easy if the temporal resolution is high. So um, by temporal resolution high, Let's say this is one measurement and this is the next measurement. And if I now look at my cell in one measurement and in the next time frame, you see that they have a lot of spatial overlap. Now we have almost perfect overlap between um, these objects. Um, but thanks to progress in segmentation, actually this now works also if you um, sample much more sparsely in time. And so. Um, here is my first object. I can project it onto the spatial axis. Here is my second object. I can project that onto the spatial axis. Maybe I should do that explicitly. So I make my space axis a little bit longer. And uh, okay, let me take a more extreme example. Let's say that my first measurement I'm making here. So if I project on the space axis, then this is what I see. And my next measurement, uh, which was red, is there. And if I project on the space axis, uh, I now get the same object, uh, but it's not overlapping itself anymore. However, um, it is possible, even with such poor spatial overlap, using the kind of embedding techniques that we were talking about when we were discussing instant segmentation, with these kind of embedding techniques, it is actually possible to figure out that even things that are, don't overlap spatially, that they still are part of the same entity with a suitably trained neural network, plenty of training data, of course. 
Um, so in, I've asked a few questions here. Um, can this handle large displacements? Uh, yes, it can. Um, does it afford a joint solution to the segmentation and the tracking problem? What do I mean by that? Well, if you show a, let's say, a, a movie showing viral particles or something like that um, to a human expert, and you ask the human expert to track the things in there, sometimes in single frames, it's not easy to discern if the signal to noise ratio is very poor, if this is, you know, is this a virus particle or not? And then humans, they go forward and backward in time, and maybe it's uh, clearer in the image before or after, or maybe it becomes clearer in the overall evolution of the phenomenon that you see. Um, so humans surely do use joint segmentation and tracking, and, and I think the ideal algorithm should also. And well, this kind of approach, I would say, yes, it can do joint segmentation and tracking. It has no problem dealing with an unknown number of particles. It has no problem dealing with dividing particles, except that it does have difficulty with giving them distinct names, as I said earlier. And it is difficult to build into that a representation for the internal state. Um, so for example, um, internal state could be something like, uh, if we look at ballistic objects, like what is their velocity, in which direction are they moving, or if it's a cell, you could uh, make a statement about um, where does it currently reside in its cell cycle. Um, so if it looks like it is going to split, is it compatible with what I um, know about where in its cell cycle the cell currently stands? Um, this kind of thing is more difficult to build into this approach, into space-time segmentation. Then there is a, another approach uh, called tracking by assignment or data association. And that's the one I will talk about most today. Um, so here we have, again, different observations. Let's say this is time t, t plus 1, t minus 1. And you first try and detect in each time frame your object of interest, shown here by the black dots. You then consider all, all possible kinds of associations. Note here that actually I have not included all possible kinds of associations. So for example, I might have added in principle, I might have added an association between this cell at t minus one and that cell at t, and I might have added that association here. Uh, the fact that I've not drawn them reflects uh, an assumption that is frequently made in these tracking approaches, uh, for example, assumption of limited velocity. Now, if I know that uh, things don't move faster than, depending on what it is, the speed of sound or <laughs> speed of light, or uh, you know, a cell cannot move faster than so and so many uh, micrometers per second, um, then you can simply truncate and you say, okay, the, those very long range connections, I'm willing to ignore them. But anyways, the principle is I first detect and I then try and figure out which of the de detections corresponds to which other. In terms of this table of criteria, yes, um, this has no problems uh, with large displacements. Um, Affording joint segmentation and tracking, yeah, to some extent you can build it into that kind of approach um, by not making definite detections, but by having multiple candidates for your objects. So you can have multiple tentative detections and uh, then you can say, all right, I want to select the best subset of these. Um, so you can at least have a um, superset of hypotheses from which you then select a subset. And, you know, if we are very good willing, we could make this into a sort of a plus, but it's not truly a joint segmentation and tracking, yeah? which is why I don't really want to put the plus here. 
let's take a few of these dots away. All right. Then uh, unknown number of particles, no problem at all. And uh, I can handle dividing particles, no problem either. Um, it cannot easily represent an internal state. Um, so you had, you've seen that in, in one of the exercises, um, if you want to find a shortest path taking into account curvature or so, then you need somehow information which is higher order in time. And well, you could say, all right, my detections, I don't really make them frame by frame, but, but I detect tracklets and then want to connect those. Yeah, so maybe, you know, there would be some work around to give an internal state, but it's not straightforward. And then there are the state space methods. Um, super important, mature class of methods. So um, the Kalman filter belongs to these, or the hidden Markov model belongs to these. And um, of the Kalman filter, it has been said that, and this is one of the ingredients that made human spaceflight possible because, well, before you shot up um, humans, uh, you had to shoot up satellites and, um, well, it's a difficult, or at least for the time, well, actually still today, it's a difficult control problem yeah, to, to make sure um, that your rocket goes where it should. And, um, well, what you have are measurements. So, you know, this is here, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is an, an important class of a directed graphical model. And we again have here different points in time. So this would be T minus one t and t plus one and uh, then i have these shaded uh, circles they represent random variables for which an observation has been made for example these could be noisy or these could represent noisy measurements for position and then we have these circles which are not shaded they represent um, the random variables in this case holding the internal state yeah, so we could have for example for the internal state I could have what is my best estimate for position and velocity. And then I have also an observed position. And knowing that there is measurement associated with these observations, I can now try and infer the true hidden state, like what is probably the true position and what is probably the true velocity. And there are two kind of simplifying assumptions here. One assumption is that, um, let's say this observation here, it depends only on the state at that point in time and not on the hidden state before and after. Okay, this is one simplifying assumption. And the other simplifying assumption um, here is this uh, first order Markovianity that my hidden state at this point in time depends only directly on the previous hidden state, but not on the hidden state, you know, two time steps ago. So this is a model from, uh, for example, classical physics would fit here, you know, the, the physics of billiards, uh, that in principle, it is enough to know the uh, positions and velocities of all objects in this frame to determine what's going to happen in the next frame. And I don't need information on what had happened even before. So if we want to summarize this method here, then one would say, well, it first detects and then associates targets just as in a tracking by assignment, but this time taking into account a hidden state. And let's work again through our table. Um, can handle large displacements, no problem at all, you know, good fit for human spaceflight. Um, affords joint segmentation and tracking, not really. It even has difficulty with handling an unknown number of particles. You know, it can be done, but it gets uh, tricky. Um, it really struggles with dividing particles. Really struggles with meaning it is possible in principle, but it just your computational effort really explodes. Yeah? So if we were really benevolent, um, you know, I could talk about multiple hypothesis tracking and 
I could uh, talk about um, Markov chain transdimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which at each point in time try and decide what if I had one more particle or not. But these are really expensive. On the good side, it does have here is the only candidate uh, an obvious representation for an internal state. All right, so none of these methods is perfect. Each of these methods has an application domain where it works best. So if I know, for example, that I'm trying to track a single satellite and I know it you know, obeys the laws of physics, then for sure I would use the Kalman filter. If I have, you know, especially a dividing targets, then I would use uh, one of the other two. If I have plenty and plenty of training data, possibly I would try and go with this type of space-time segmentation approach. If, as it so often happens, I don't have plenty and plenty of training data, well, maybe this one here is my candidate of choice. And well, this, this is the one that I'm going to talk about most today. In all three schools, what's the connection to deep learning and such? In all three schools, you will have a, a neural network that gets dense input. So you know, let's say I get a two-dimensional video, so I have spatial dimensions x and y, and I have the temporal dimension t. Um, this would be a video that I get. Um, then I put this into a neural network, or let's say the neural network will then give me some output, which usually has the same dimensions as the input. Yeah? So we have x and y and t. But what I really want to get out, or let's say I'm, I'm tracking cells and I'm talking to biologists, what they want to get out is not this dense thing. They don't want a billion pixels back. Uh, but they want a, res a result in terms of a lineage tree. So they want to know, okay, first there was one cell and then it divided. One of the uh, daughters died, uh, but the other kept uh, dividing happily thereafter. So I want to get this kind of, so here my input is dense. My, the output of my neural network is dense. But what I really want to get ultimately is something sparse. Yeah? And this is, this transition from dense to sparse is not something that convolutional neural networks are good at. And um, this is where then these, uh, well, what I've called here tracking approaches, where they really come in. Yeah? So at some point you have to make a painful decision of saying, okay, this is a candidate for a detection, or this is a segmentation hypothesis, and now I'm going to associate them. Or similarly, in this space-time segmentation, if I want to give all the daughter cells a unique, a unique name, then I at some point must make a, um, a discrete decision of saying, all right, here is split, and then uh, there the track ended, but this track split into two, and so on. So this is how I see the relation to um, the deep neural network. The, the better, of course, and the better train the deep neural network, the easier this step from, or the more accurate and the easier the step from going to dense to sparse will be. But the step is still required and is still non-trivial. All right, so this was an overview of the three schools of tracking. And next, we will go into, you know, the algorithmics of how can we actually set up and in particular solve such a problem.